And we're live. Sweet. Hey, everybody. Glad to have you here with us this week. After two weeks of doing Friday shows, we're back at our usual Thursday time. As you can see beneath my picture here, I am the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin D. Terrio, Pontifex Maximus of a worldwide secret organization called the Cult of Copy. We're actually not that secret since we have a URL that I'm giving you on a free YouTube show. But shh, that's just our marketing. You may be wondering what all this bling is about. Don't worry, I'll tell you in a minute. But for now, what you need to know is that the Cult of Copy is a, a Facebook group of 10,000, over 10,000, uh, fine folks dedicated to studying the arts of persuasion, particularly with a bent towards marketing, but we're not afraid to delve into the dark side of things like uh, cult leaders, con artists, political propaganda, any of that kind of stuff. So if you like that kind of thing, check out our shows. Our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash cult of copy, has 21 previous episodes of this show, including an episode zero. Uh, if you like what we talk about here, you'll like the discussion group. Go ahead and join. I approve new members uh, weekly. Uh, let's see. I talked about me. I talked about the cult. Oh, yeah, the show. Uh, so we record these shows live every Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern, uh, at the YouTube channel that you are probably watching this on now, even if you're watching it live. Uh, again, that's YouTube.com slash Cult of Copy. You can watch all of our previous episodes there. If you dig it, please subscribe. Also, I know I keep threatening this, but in the near future, it will also be a podcast for audio-only listeners via iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, if you are listening to this at some far-flung future date and uh, you like what you hear, please click like and rate us well and all of that stuff. So as you may have seen, um, what we're going to talk about this week is my post-mortem breakdown of my trip to... Uh, JV Zoo's Marketing Mayhem this past weekend in Orlando. Um, I, I used to go to a lot more events. This year I kind of took it easy because of the baby being born. Um, so this is really only the second event I've gone to this year when usually I go to seven or eight. If you watched last week's episode, I did it live from the event with my buddy uh, and colleague Tim Castleman. Um, previous to the event, Tim's uh, excellent Two Drink Ten podcast was about uh, how to get the most out of marketing events. I didn't get to listen to that whole, ep whole episode, so I thought this would be an interesting companion piece, me not having heard his to see how much we agree on. I'm going to do mine after the event. So you can go check out his podcast too, Two Drink Tim, Tim Castleman. He was our guest last week. Check that episode out if you missed it. But uh, we'll see how similar our content ends up being. But before we get to that, I wanted to uh, address, uh, we got, uh, according to Zane, this is our first negative complaint we've ever gotten in the comments of the show. So after 21, so, well, actually 22 if you count episode zero, 22 episodes, we are, uh, you know, right up there past, uh, is that past the halfway point? 24 and 24 would be, you no, know, 22, would be 44 episodes. Half. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're getting close. We're getting close. We're within a few episodes of doing half a year's worth. It's pretty good. Maybe it's just because we don't have enough viewers, because last week Tim was talking about these guys that have a YouTube channel. They get like 10,000 wishes for them to kill themselves every day via YouTube comments. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait for those days, but this is our first negative comment, and uh, I replied to it, but uh, I wanted to put it up on screen because after doing this for half a year, it's a good time to talk about what the show is about, why we're doing it. So put it up there, Zane. We'll read it out loud for audio-only listeners. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've got the comments up on the on the screen. I'm All right. It, so it so. says, it is from Hope Springs Eternal 70 <laughs> right. via YouTube. Yeah. So, you know, awesome anonymous comment. It says, appreciate what you do. Thank you. But some constructive criticism. You talk a lot of nothing. <laughs> 15 minutes in and nothing. Maybe lay off the ganja before filming. I love the ganja, but dude. First of all, ellipses only have three periods, but that's okay because a lot of people make that mistake. Second of all, I want to say thank you. I'm like not even mad at this post because it's not going to be taken as constructive criticism, and we'll talk about that. But uh, the thing with the show is like it's like the 
the business part of what I do is inside the cult of copy. This show is really, I like doing it. I do it for free. We get together for a week. We talk for an hour. It gives me an excuse to make my research worthwhile. You know, like I could just research stuff to educate myself. But if I have a platform to turn around and just ramble about it, I get to stay sharp. I get to talk. I get to make content, which gives me rankings, which puts people into the cult, which then makes me money later. But the thing with the cult show is I do it the way that I want because that's how I want to do it and it's it's free so if I did it the way uh, Hope Springs Eternal 70 wanted I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do it so you know it's my prerogative if I want to ha have a little drinky poo or or whatever the case may be before the show and if we get to rambling in case you didn't notice we do this show live uh, in one take I just kinda show up and talk I have various degrees of preparation that I do before these shows, and what's funny is the comment, the the video episode that that comment is on is one of our like super extra long ones where I actually had prepared content and felt obligated to deliver it all inside of one episode. So that episode actually took two hours. So I don't know. Complain about the first fifteen minutes if you want. I whatever. The thing is. If you don't like the way I do the show, if I ramble too much for you, you're not a fan, that's cool. There's plenty of other shows that I guess are more concise and to the point with this kind of thing. But I like to do it live without a safety net. I just kind of show up and talk. Yeah, sometimes I ramble. Some episodes are going to be good. Some are going to be worse than others. But I will be back next week to take up hopefully an hour or if more, only slightly more uh, every week. And I appreciate you coming every time. Uh, if you don't, no big deal. Like, you can join the cult and read at your leisure if you want, if you like the topic and don't like listening to me talk about it. It's no obligation to listen to the show, but I love that you make it if you like the show. So if you do like it, please subscribe. If you don't, no sweat. Like, you want to comment about the content of the show? That's cool. I don't plan on changing the format anytime soon. Uh, because it does, I do it for me, and it does what it does for me because of the way I do it, which is little preparation, able to get up in front of an audience and talk about my core topic. So, eh, you know, shrug to that comment. Thanks for the feedback, though. I do appreciate you watching. I do appreciate the feedback. But for regular viewers and future viewers, this is how it's going to be. It just is the way that it is. Thanks for sticking around anyway. That said, 10 minutes in before we get to the topic. Ooh. All right. So, like I said, I went to this event, uh, JV Zoo's Marketing Mayhem. I've been good friends with uh, one of the co-owners. I have all, all the co-owners, but technically the one I'm talking about here would be uh, EBR, E. Brian Rose, who uh, was also the host of the event, likes to put on parties at events. So it's a good time. Uh, it's the second event they've had. I spoke at the first one. This time I went just for funsies and, like I said, to, to rekindle old connections and maybe meet some new people that have come up in the world since I last poked my head out at a live event in March. Um, excellent event, as always, but we'll talk about a little more detail about each of these sections. So hopefully everyone watching this that's involved in the same industry that I am, I am in, which is sort of generalized Internet marketing stuff, you know the importance of going to live events uh, in your industry. If you are not in the same industry that I am, uh, it's probably still important in your field. If there are live events that people pay to go to, you should probably go. They're immensely valuable. They're a huge shortcut. They're part of the reason I was able to have the success that I currently enjoy uh, in the relatively short amount of time that I've been able to achieve it, I it feels short to me. Uh, <laughs> if you can't wait 15 minutes, your hope isn't very eternal from Shopping Guru. Very nice, very nice comment there, Zane. <laughs> I love the Mr. T starter set. See, someone else got it. I had several people not realize that it was a Mr. T costume, but again, we'll talk about that in a bit. So, jumping into uh, the detailed notes on this week's subject, um, let's see. Events. Success at events. This is 
actually something I probably wouldn't have been able to write up if I wouldn't have given myself time to think about it and maybe didn't uh, go to so few events in a year, incidentally, because of the kids. So it gave me sort of time to think about what I do at events, why I go to them, what I get out of them, and then give it even more thought when I came back because my recovery period was very slow. Uh, needless to say, your, your liver and kidneys take a beating at these things, I'm sure. Every other business conference ever is the same way, but the bars make a lot of money at these things. So that said, first secret of event success. I, like I said, I didn't speak at this event, but I have spoken at the previous one. I, I normally, most of the events I go to in any given year because I have speaking engagements at that event. The stage is literally the best, most valuable place to be at any live event. So I know maybe a lot of the people listening to this don't consider themselves to be speakers, but I want to encourage you to change that as soon as you can because it's such an easy and fast, direct way to establish yourself as an authority, even when you look the way that I do. Um, but I don't want you to be scared of it because uh, there's video. I have video. I don't know how widely circulated it is. The first marketing event that I went to as myself, not as an employee of a larger company, but as a freelancer trying to make a name for myself, um, I was an attendee. I didn't speak there. And uh, they had a, a hot seat where you had to get up on stage in front of everyone and sort of say who you were and what your business was about. And the panel of experts who were hosting the event would give you uh, some critique. And in the video of me doing that, like, I'm not even on stage. I'm in the audience in front of a microphone, and I'm so nervous that my voice cracks. So I knew that was something I had to change because I knew getting on stage was going to be important for my career, which is why I started doing shows like this one. Um, a year, like, a year and a half maybe before I started this show back up, I had a previous show that ran for a year and a half, and the explicit goal of that show, even though, like, only 30 people ever saw it week by week, um, the whole point of doing that show was to make me better at preparing less and being confident in front of camera and on stage so that I can give off that authority vibe of being comfortable in talking about what I know in a relaxed way in front of an audience pretty much at the drop of a hat. Last year, in fact, at the JV Zoo event, I was one of the like B-list speakers. I was not a keynote, so I think I had like 45 minutes. And I gave a talk with no slides, off the cuff, with an outline only as a safety net. And that was the first time I'd ever done a live presentation with no preparation. And uh, it worked out really well, I think. At least I, I remember it working out well. Lots of people clapped. So I think I did okay. Um, the point of that is that if you're not good at it, get good at it. Because the goal of speaking is to show effortless expertise, let's call it. And people are so afraid of public speaking, again, myself included, that anyone who can do it is automatically going to be seen as an expert. So let's say you're past all that, you're ready, you want to speak at an event. Colin, how did you get to speak on stage at events when no one knew you? Well, first of all, it wasn't that no one knew me. Lots of people knew me because of some of the things that we'll talk about later in the show, basically how to make a bunch of friends at these events out of the kind of people who put on future events. Um, but uh, primarily, let's see. Okay, so the two ways that I finagled my way on stage before I had a reputation as a good speaker from being seen on stage was um, I would bug people, which is like... One time I had someone who I knew was being asked to be a speaker bother the organizer of the event and tell them that I should speak too. That worked out. I got that gig. Other times I have a, I guess you would call it begging, kind of, at key events that I really wanted to be a part of. Um, I would have already been friends with the organizer of said event through other avenues, but I basically said, you know, what do I need to do to get a speaker spot in there? Doesn't matter what time, uh, you know, 
doesn't have to be a full room or anything. I'm not a prima donna. I just want to be on that stage at that event. It would be cool for me. What what can I do for you? Um, and having the services that I had to provide, it worked out pretty good. I would say probably 60, 70 percent close rate on that without doing any follow-up whatsoever. Um, now I'm at the point where I do uh, paid gigs, and very rarely do I not. I'll sometimes do unpaid gigs if they let me sell things directly from the stage. I prefer both. If you'll pay me and let me sell things from the stage, that would be ideal. Otherwise, if I've been in an event and you haven't paid me or let me sell anything from stage, it's because we're friends and you asked very nicely and I wanted to go to wherever your event was. Um, but that might not help you in the future, just so you know. No, I'm just kidding. Um, that is the trick is that you, you quickly want to segue to like speaking is speaking is a way to build up your audience and build up your business, but it should be as as quickly as you gain a reputation for having quality talks, you should step up to being a paid or at least compensated speaker at any event that you participate in because again, the whole point of getting on the stage is to be an authority. If you want to be an authority, you should be paid for it. Oh look, Zane's got a quote up on the screen. Is that is that a bit that you like, Zane? Uh, no, this is uh, just making a, a comment for everyone to see and review. Oh, uh, nice. You said event secret number one. Just pointing it out as a as a visual reference as you talk. Nice. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is when you go to these events. At least in my industry, it's very very common practice that they record all the speakers. If you go to an event and there's a camera crew there filming the crap out of the stage, my biggest recommendation to you, and this may seem counterintuitive, don't hang out in the big room where the speakers are talking all day because you can watch it later. What you won't be able to get later is interaction with like probably very cool people in your industry that didn't need to be in the main room, but they're out in the lobby hobnobbing and chatting with their friends. It's going to be way more valuable for you to not be in that big room with people giving talks that you will be able to get watched later. What you're going to miss out on by doing that is uh, anything they're going to try and sell to you from the stage as part of a limited offer, but I bet if you contact them later and say, hey, I saw this in the video recording of this live event, what kind of deal can you get me? They'll probably cut you some kind of deal. But don't feel bad. You're not really messing out, missing out because the most valuable stuff is really going to be what you can get into out in the hall, which is making contacts with either people who are ahead of you in the industry you want to advance in so they know who you are and you actually get to interact with them, and people who are up and coming in your industry who are going to be somebodies who are maybe at the level that you are now. So like a lot of the people that speak at these events that I go to, we all kind of got started in my industry at the same time. And as older folks kind of, not older folks as an elderly, just people, people in it a couple of years ahead of us as they kind of rotated out. Veter veterans. Yeah, veterans. That's a good way to put it. Thank you, Zane. In addition to being a director, he's a living th thesaurus. Um, so in addition to uh, meeting those veterans, you're going to meet these people uh, like my friends where we all kind of came up at the same time and kept meeting again and again like moving up in the world speaking at events and having our own memberships and things um, so you build kind of like an inner circle just from continuing to interact with the same people over and over but if you're sitting in the main room by yourself listening to the speakers and taking notes you're not you're not meeting anybody you're not making friends you really can listen to all that stuff later if it's important to you I don't I don't even do that, honestly. I probably missed out on a lot of stuff because I don't even consume the information that presumably is what sells the tickets to go to these events. Yes, it makes me a hypocrite because I myself am one of the people who speak at these events. What can you do? Sometimes I'll be in the room like if it's a buddy and maybe they haven't spoken in a while or they're giving a good talk and they want the room to be full. I'm down for that, but I'm not really going to be paying attention to the content because, like I said, the real value I get is talking to people. Um, 
Let's see, next thing. Be memorable. So, now we get to the part with why I have all of this bling on. Also, why I shaved my head into a mohawk. Although, before I even do that, if you know me, I mean, I have this weird beard. I wear sunglasses inside all the time. Uh, I wear brightly colored sneakers. I kind of dress like a cartoon character. I'm not a very normal-looking dude to begin with. But the thing to remember is I went to art school. So it's one of these deals like I've always kind of been a weird dresser, noticeable, wear interesting T-shirts, things like that, right? I'm not afraid to dress in a way that brings attention to myself. That's kind of a lifelong thing. I just did it that way, you know? That's just how I am. But it served well because I'm also an introvert and I'm not great at introducing myself to people. I've met awesome people because they like the comic books that are on the T-shirts I'm wearing. I've had people come up to me and comment on my insanely brightly colored sneakers, bright green ones, for example, if you saw me this weekend. I also had blue ones and red ones. I like a variety. Um, the beard has done a lot of that. It makes people come to me and want to interact with me in a way that makes it so I don't have to be butting in on conversations. It just sort of happens. I stand around and people include me in because they want to talk about me. I can't help it. I'm just so handsome, I guess. But you don't have to take it to that degree. I mean, like, a fancy... Like, you can do it with dressing nice, for example. Like, people who dress uh, unnaturally well. Like, people who wear nice, super tailored suits to these events stand out also uh, in other ways. You just sort of want to know your crowd and figure out a way to stand out. Um, about the... Uh, the Mr. T bling and jewelry and stuff, what happened was this party, I mentioned EBR likes to put on themed parties at these events, and uh, this is the second event where they've had an 80s themed party. <laughs> Sean Thresher says, I pity the foo. Yes, indeed, that is what Mr. T says, and I am dressed like Mr. T. Awesome for picking up the reference. Um, but they had an 80s party, so being that I already had the beard, I had the idea to go as Mr. T. So once I figured out that, yes, there would be adequate, gaudy, but not too expensive jewelry to uh, complete the look, I went to the mall haircut place because it was at a, this place, the Florida Hotel and Mall in Orlando, which is a mall with a hotel attached. It's actually a fairly nice hotel and a pretty good mall. But I spent, you know, about 100 bucks on an old lady bling between the rings and the earrings and the bracelets and the, all the chains. Not that much considering how much jewelry it is, but uh, I made a Mr. T costume, basically. I had the, the gym socks pulled all the way up. Just having done that, putting putting uh, the, uh, the jewels on and getting the crazy haircut, which I'm usually kind of a low-key person. You Like, a lot of people said they didn't expect me to shave my head into a mohawk. They're like... I didn't know you would care that much about a contest. And I'm like, in your world, being able to shave your head into a mohawk on a split decision equals caring. I get it. For To me, that says I, I don't care very much. But whatever, whatever way you want to interpret it, I went to art school. I'm fine with the audience judging things the way that they want to. It's equally valid as what I intended. The point is, I got... My picture taken a lot. We'll talk about the importance of having your picture taken a lot uh, at these events in a minute. But it made me memorable, right? Like a lot of people are going to remember me now beyond even the regular weirdo that I was because I dressed like Mr. T one night and took photos with a bunch of people uh, at a costume party. So participate in these things. Be a part of things and uh, be involved in the events that are happening within the event. And that will make you more memorable, which means more contacts. Um, Let's see. Um, we already talked about talking to as many people as possible. Here's some tips on making contacts. So business cards. I go to these events. Everybody's got a fancy business card. It's got a million words on it. Everyone wants to see what it says. I wish I had remembered to grab you one of mine. I hardly carry them around, but I have a bunch still in my laptop bag because I just leave them there. I don't even do this anymore, but my business cards, I made them special for events. And it said, Colin Terrio writes awesome copy. And I had my real email address and my real phone number, and that's it. That's all it said. 
and I would tell people, this is my real cell phone. You won't get like a secretary or anything. I didn't even have a secretary at the time. But I made sure that people understood, like, I made these just for the event, and I'm giving it to you, like, because we're buddies now. So if you have a card at the event, don't make it like a regular boring business card. Even if your business card is interesting for a business card, it's still boring because it's a business card. So if you have one, make it seem special, like just for the event, and make it like minimal and impactful. So that'll make it stand out from everybody else's business card. But most of the time, like if you're like me, you got a pocket full of business cards by the end of the night. I throw them in my suitcase, and then when I get home, I throw them away. Sorry. Sorry, I know it was probably expensive to print a bunch of those. That's why I do a thing I'll tell you about in a second. But what you should do instead of accepting people's business cards is instead take a picture with them and then connect with them on Facebook so you can tag them in the picture when you post it. And then that way, you're not just a business card in their suitcase that's going to get thrown away. You're actually already connected in a much better way, much more directly. And you can interact with them and follow up after that. But then what you do is you say, listen, let's do this instead. And then that way you can keep your business card because I'm a dumbass. I'm probably going to lose it anyway. That way you can give it to a real business contact. Instead, let's be friends. Let's make friends. Let's take a picture together. We'll tag it on Facebook. Way, way better way to make contacts than just trading business cards very old school style. So that's something that's worked very well for me at getting directly connected uh, to people and then using that twist to say you're not rejecting their business card. You're like save it for someone who's into that. We'll be friends and then that way we'll be connected and you won't have to lose a business card because of me um, because I'm just going to lose it or throw it away. Um, We talked about following up. Once you like get a photo with them and you you get them to agree to connect with your account via being friends and you can share it and tag them. You do all that. Like just check out their profile. Comment on a couple of things you agree with. When you post things that are similar to things they talked about, tag them. That's it. Just like keep them in the loop, get them involved, let them remember who you are. It's also very useful if you update your avatar with a picture of you at the event. So like they have that synergy, they make that connection. And, oh, yeah, it's that guy I talked to. That'll help. But uh, like I said, the whole point going to these events and interacting with people is to grow your network. So don't physically network there and then try and social network later. Like integrate that. Do it right there. Connect with them directly and make it so that you kind of seal up being connected to them before you even leave the event that weekend. That's what I would recommend. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Also, I didn't mention explicitly, but obviously if you've been watching the show for a minute here, Zane is keeping an eye on the comments. So if you leave a comment on the YouTube channel or in the Facebook posts about uh, the show here, we'll be able to interact with it and answer it and chat with you live because it is a live show. Um, Now that I told you what the point of all this Mr. T stuff is, I'm going to take it off because it's heavy and it's hot out here in Georgia. So... Let's do that for a minute before we get into the next thing that we're going to talk about, which is um, being in photos. (laughs) So that's actually an explicit one. I guess I kind of steamrolled my way into it already. But uh, the trick with being in photos, right, number one, we already covered, which is being memorable. In addition to that being useful to getting inside of people's brains, it's useful Uh, for the purpose of taking photographs because people are going to want to take photographs with you and they will remember uh, the stuff in the photographs. So like these green shoes, in fact, that I'm wearing, I actually bought them at that mall at the JVZoo event the previous year and uh, Coolio was the musical guest at that particular event and uh, I got to go backstage and meet him and say hi and take a picture and he happened to also have bright green shoes. So we took a picture together, and uh, I ended up getting a lot of uh, social media credit for that. Back in a second, I actually have to take my headphones off to take off all of these chains. Be right back with you.
bad that was super loud. I just realized I was dropping the chains directly on top of the microphone. No, it's <laughs> it's cool. I just I posted a comment that just said uh, Colin is unblinging. I am, I am. If you know me, you know that that Jules is not really my style, and uh, I joke with my wife that I'm so I'm so unblingy that I uh, I don't even wear a, a wedding ring. But don't tell anybody that's because I got too fat. <laughs> it doesn't fit anymore. Um, Sean Thresher asks, is this considered peacocking? I mean, kind of. For people not in the know, peacocking is what uh, pickup artists who train the pickup ladies will talk about when you, like, have some sort of visual flair to make yourself stand out from the field of all the male competition. It's kind of like that, but not for the same purpose. It's just, like, being interesting looking. Like, so many... It's funny because this hotel is attached to a mall, but you'll see what I mean. Like, like go to a mall or go to any public place and notice how similarly and completely unforgettable, I'm sorry, unmemorable, completely forgettable people look in general. And it's because, like, we all shop at the same place, and those places all carry the same kind of clothes. Everyone's got kind of the same kind of haircut. Just do, like, one little thing different so that you stand out, and uh, it'll help. It'll, it'll make people remember you better. Uh, just because. So, like, when I first started speaking from stage, even, I was in a field where a lot of dudes wore suits. So instead, I dressed like a slacker. And then everybody started to dress like a slacker, so I spoke at an event. Once I started the cult, I got myself what I call my evangelist suit, and it was a head-to-toe white suit, white shirt, white shoes, white belt, with a bright red necktie. Uh, So I gave a whole talk wearing not just a suit, but an obnoxious suit. Um, so in a way, yeah, it's like for the, for the same purpose, maybe as peacocking to stand out, but not for the same intent. You're not like trying to bone anyone. Well, maybe you are. I'm married, but the goal is just to be memorable against the crowd, so that when you are trying to introduce and meet and become known, ah, there it is. Saint found the picture of it. Nice. I forgot I had the matching hat. I was baller. Um, I also had red sunglasses, but they're not in that picture. Anyways, uh, yeah, it's to make you stand out so that people remember you when you're trying to meet new people. It registers better in their head that you stand out, but it really, really registers when you do the follow-up, like we talked about, so that they can reconnect, because when they see you and you look weird, they'll make note of it, but when you remind them of it later, They'll remember. When I say weird, I don't mean weird, just like different. You know, something to stand out. Could be a weird shirt, could be bright shoes, could anything, anything. Just look slightly different than everybody else. Um, Sean Thresher says if you're really smart, you use a service like ifttt.com and set up a follow up system with the business cards. I guess I could pretend what I know what you're talking about there, Sean, but if you want to explain it in a comment for everyone's benefit, that would be cool. I know it. If then, if this, then that is the service, but I'm not sure what you mean via the business cards, but I like to uh, save some trees by not accepting other people's business card and then instead offering the pose for a photo and then tagging them. That works way better for what I do, but then again, I'm super active on Facebook, so your mileage may vary, but keep it in mind. Um, Also, for being in photos, we talked about this already, uh, participate, which is to say there are going to be things going on as events within the event, like people will have organized little roundtable meetups or dinner appointments with little clutches of people or, uh, like we said, parties. Each event will probably have, like, evening activities that aren't necessarily officially part of the event but are sort of gathering places do that stuff. So many times I'll go to events and there will be people who go to the event, are there in the main room taking notes, and then when the event part of the day is over, they're gone. Like they're not downstairs having drinks, they're not taking in meals with people, they're not interacting or mingling, like you're wasting it. You're what you're wasting the whole event. You could just watch the videos at home and save yourself the plane fare if you're going to do that. It's like these things aren't in super fancy hotels. It's not that much of a treat. It's like, okay, but, you know, I'd rather sleep at home if I could. Um, So, yeah, be sure to participate in all the different things 
that they have going on at these events. Um, let's see. The final thing I want to say about photos is if you're beginning your career, it's okay to be that person who's like, hey, can I take a picture with you, Mr. Speaker, celebrity person? That's cool. That's a good start. It's a good way to get yourself associated with people, but you don't want to make it so that you're like the starstruck fan getting autographs for your book, right? So like, if it makes sense, like when you go to Disney World and you get your picture taken with all the characters, it's obvious that you're the person who paid to be there, and they're the entertainment. You want to make it seem like Mickey Mouse saw you and wanted to have his picture taken with you. That's the real way to get value out of having pictures taken. So that won't happen until you're a little more well-known, like if you're speaking at the event, for example. Um, but if you do take the pictures yourself, these are a few tips that I found. Don't have someone take the picture of you like it's posed. Do it as a selfie so that you're taking a selfie of you with the celebrity person that you're trying to be associated with because that makes it seem like you're doing it for your audience which likes you versus like, oh, I'm posing for my scrapbook. It's a subtle, very, very subtle thing, but it works really, really well. My friend, who in fact has been on a previous episode of uh, this show, Ryan McKinney, sort of is famous for taking these, he calls them reverse selfies, where what he wants to take a picture of is in the background, and he puts himself in the foreground like making a face and takes the picture over his shoulder. Those are hilarious. I like those. Joel Com is another one who takes lots of selfies and puts quotes on them and things, does a good job with that. But that whole idea, if you're going to be like posing with a cool person you met and you want to take a picture as a fan, do it as a selfie and you'll look a little bit cooler and more authoritative than if you take it like a normal fan photo that everyone takes. Um, finally, this is a cool one. Um, have someone take the picture of you if you're going to have someone else take the picture. A lot of times what will happen when this picture taking stuff is happening is there will be a little crowd of people taking pictures, right? So if you're having your picture taken with celebrity person here, like straight on in front, and everyone is like lined up to take pictures, ask someone to take your picture, but ask them to take the picture of you having your picture taken with that person by someone else, if that makes sense. So like, say it's me and Tim Castleman and we're having our picture taken together. And I would say, hey Zane, can you take a picture of us on your phone and send me one? And then I would give my camera to someone else over here and have a picture of Zane taking the picture of both of us. And then I would publish that one. So it looks like someone has a picture of me having my photo taken with a celebrity. Subtly different than actually having your photo taken with a celebrity. But again, it's about perspective. It's about points of view and how to let the camera portray a certain story, if that makes sense. Did I explain that well? If I didn't, leave a comment, and I'll try to explain it better. But basically, you want a picture of the person taking your picture with a celebrity so that it looks like that was just something that was happening and you have a photo of it happening. Subtle but powerful. So that's all I want to say about taking pictures. Um, the next one, uh, meetings. Uh, like I said, if you're spending all of your time in the main room, you aren't going to get invited to these little small group meetings that occur. Um, one of uh, my earliest dinner meetings uh, was at a Practical Profits event. In fact, this is... Uh, I think it was the second one I went to. The first one is the one where my voice cracked, asking the stage a question. I didn't speak at the second one, but I had spoken at events by then. And even though I wasn't part of the group, I got invited to their group dinner just by being friends with them and being involved and interacting and everything. And I learned a lot at that table, which was a meeting of their group. I just got to come along because I hang around and make friends with everybody. Um, that kind of thing is very valuable, so you want to get involved enough with people where you can have these meetings, and if there are people going that you're, like, you maybe know but you're not closely connected with, reach out to them via social media and say, look, man, I'm going to be at this event. I'm not saying we've got to have like a private sit-down or anything, but I specifically want to tug your ear about a couple of questions. So if you see me or if I see you, I would love to chat with you about it 
whenever you have a free moment there, that would be cool. So setting up those kind of things to where you're actually setting your own agenda based on who you know is going to be at that event. That's a very powerful thing to do, too. Um, room parties are something that happen at these events. And this is where the cool kids go to do things like, and I'm not pointing fingers, get smoking fees charged to rooms, um, drink like moonshine. Things get weird, dudes. All kind of crazy things happen. But you only get invited to those parties if you're one of the cool kids. And I ain't going to lie, rich people in hotels sometimes have illicit activities going on. So if you're not cool with that, skip this one. Because you don't want to be that guy who's like, oh, I'm not having fun because people are doing things I don't approve of. Not cool. If you're that person, don't go. But if you can hang, like I said, I went to art school, seen some weird things. I'm all right with it. You get invited to hang out with the cool kids. Now, the, the trick with this is you got to understand at these events, it's people cutting loose, right? It's not really their normal day-by-day -day self. So don't judge anybody drunk they end up in the fountain or threatening to stab a colleague in the heart with a lawn chair, taking a shower with an open bottle of cinnamon whiskey. These are all things that I've seen happen in one night this past weekend. But all different people, too. This was not one person's rampage. I know these people to be otherwise very professional people, but, you know, you get together, get to see people that you're really good friends with that you don't get to spend a lot of time with. You overdo it, maybe, with the substances. You party a little too hard. Things get crazy, but that's fun. But there's a very powerful psychological thing to think about. It's almost like being in combat to where it's a high-stress situation and the people you're with, you automatically have a camaraderie with. Partying can be like that, especially when it's like intense and crazy and very strong things happen to create memories that you didn't have before. So you really want to get involved with the people in your industry in that kind of way because it creates very powerful alliances, very powerful relationships, real friendships that are beneficial to you. And I don't mean that in a way like, haha, I'm pretending to be your friend so that I can get business stuff out of you. The trick is, I've, I have no idea who said it, but I've heard it said many times, your income is the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So find the people who make a bunch more money and live the life that you want to live and become their actual friend in real life. Spend time with them at these events. That stuff rubs off on you. The best stuff that I got at this specific event was at like two in the morning in someone's room having one of these private meetings, drinking after the bars closed, being loud, being obnoxious, causing problems for regular patrons. I got stuff that's going to double my business. Basically, my friend laid out his funnel. Not going to name names. Thanks. You know who you are. It's going to be a big deal. Very easy to do. And it was only shared because I was in that context. I wouldn't have learned that in the main room because I don't even think he spoke. And if he did speak, it wouldn't have been about that. I got insider stuff because we're friends and we're in circle of trust. That's how you build these things. All the people I spend time with at these events, I don't know them outside of my work. I only met them through going to these events and participating. It's been very, very beneficial to be both their friend and associated with those people. Um, let's see. Also, one more note before we move on to the next one. Um, I mentioned part of the whole like refusing a business card exchange and demanding connection on social media right then and there with the photo so you can tag them. That forcibly makes them put you in a slightly different category. Instead of an acquaintance, you're more of a friend now. And it's super subtle, but it's the kind of thing where like the next morning when you're in line getting coffee, instead of a little nod from that person, they're going to come over and ask how you are, what you got into last evening. That's when you know it's working. Like you're connected deeper. They want to engage at a deeper level. Well, this thing when you, you get involved in these meetings among friends, it changes your context. You're not a potential prospect. You're not a potential JV or a business partner. You are. That's in the field. But now you're a friend first. So any business stuff that might come up later when you're not in a, a partying context, you're going to be in the circle of friends. Does that make sense? You're in a place with a bunch of people 
become their friend because you can talk about business when everybody's back to work. I think a lot of people waste a lot of contacts and opportunities because they get up in people's face at these events and all they want to do is talk business. And I think to realize very successful internet marketing people are working all day every day online when they come to these events they essentially kind of want to unwind and hang out with the friends that they haven't seen in a while. Sure they'll talk business but if you meet them at the level that they want to participate in that'll work way 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 better and then you can tap into those as business relationships further down the line. Um, Zane put some up on screen was that just a summary of something I said or was that a comment yeah. I need to look at? Oh, yeah, okay. no, no, it was just a, <laughs> it was a quick summary back to a point, just uh, mostly reiterating again, visually, uh, make, make friends, not contacts. Sweet. Okay, so the next one is a specific type of meeting. I mentioned it in brief, but we're going to talk about it in more detail, is uh, meals, right? So getting together for lunches at these things, everybody has to eat. Usually they make a good job of, like, putting the hotel near places to eat. You have multiple meals, and the thing to realize, uh, okay, so first of all, there's two different kinds of meals. There's the ones with big groups, and then there's the ones that are much smaller, maybe even just you and one other person. Let's talk about group ones first. The thing to realize is there are different crowds present at different types of meals. So the people that you're going to meet at breakfast, bright and early, whole different kind of person with what they know, what they're good at, what their strengths are, than the kind of people who are meeting for breakfast at Denny's on the way home from the club before going to bed. Whole different crowd. You can learn a lot from both because, like I said, all the people at these events are all very successful people. Just live different lives, do different things with themselves that they enjoy with their money. But that's the thing to keep in mind. Different crowds at every meal. Lunch is going to be the same way depending on where you go for lunch is going to be different. Um, same thing with dinner. Booking big, nice, fancy dinners is a cool way to make super good friends with high-powered allies. So what you want to do anytime you go to one of these events, scope it out ahead of time, find out all the hot, like, kind of pricey baller restaurants are where, like, people would like to go, gourmet food, like, badass steaks, like, uh, high-end, you know, uh, fancy eating. And then what you do is you say, hey, look, I got reservations at this place. I'm trying to get a little crew together. It's a really nice. I've never been there, but it's got awesome reviews. It's local. If you want to check it out, that's much better than a bunch of us are going to Ruby Tuesdays. Do you want to join us? See, I'm making fun of EBR again, but <laughs> um, I guess you had to be there. It's not that funny otherwise. But I, I enjoyed the impression. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the... The trick with doing this, uh, going to these big group dinners and setting them up that way, is again, it's, it's positioning. You're taking people out, but you're making it something special, something memorable, something different. So it's not just like, hey, we're trying to do the same old boring business meeting shit that you got out of the corporate world because you're bored with. No, it's cool. We're like ballers. We're like, hey, we got like five of us going to the steakhouse. It's going to be on. We're going to do drinks. We're going to do appetizers. We're going to do like six sides, and we're going to share them all over the table. It's going to be crazy. Let's do it. That kind of thing is fun. Rent a limo or something, or line up a bunch of taxis. Organize these kind of things. That's cool. I say this having never done that myself, but I get invited to a bunch of them. So if you do that in an event, I'll come. Think about it. <laughs> um, that's now, that's some, some good positioning there, Colin. I know, right? I actually learned this from, um, God, I don't want to forget his name, Sohail. Sohail Khan, who... Uh, in case you didn't know, is a JV broker. Um, I'm just joking. He advertises that a lot. Um, I saw him speak one time, and he took the crappy first spot on the first day. And he talked about how if you want to connect with the speakers, offer to buy them a meal when you get them alone. And me having spoken at a few events and gotten that crappy spot, I'm like, that's smart because then – you don't have to buy any food all weekend. You get on stage and tell people to buy you all your food. And I'm like, that's a good idea. So I will never regret being given the morning spot again. Um, that worked out uh, pretty good. So keep that in mind, too, when you speak. Um, let's talk about smaller group meals. Now, I want to give you this advice if you're going to corner a speaker 
or like a higher end person and say, hey, can, can I buy you lunch? And so we can talk about my business. It's creepy and weird, man. Like, like I, I want to, but not really because you're not making it sound fun. You know what I mean? Like, I won't mind it, but you're not ringing any bells when you put it that way. And uh, I would recommend against that. What you want to do instead is if you want it to be a small group, <laughs> Laura says EBR apparently sounds like Bert from Bert and Ernie. Well, it wasn't so much uh, a strict imitation as it was. He was like, hey, a bunch of us are going to eat. Do you want to follow us and see where we're going? Well, like, where are you going? He's like, I don't know yet. And they ended up walking to Ruby Tuesdays, which is like one of three restaurants in this mall. And I'd already eaten there like four times, so I just kind of like peeled off the back of the line and went to do something else. Isn't it also uh, like the furthest restaurant from the hotel too? No, no, that's actually uh, a California Pizza Kitchen. It's inside the same mall, but I swear it's like a mile away. It's insane. Yeah, it's it's huge. It's It's actually – the the mall is so huge, it's actually shorter to walk out the front of the hotel and cross the parking lot to get to where the pizza kitchen is than it is to walk there inside the air-conditioned mall because of the way it curbs. Anyway, mall physics. It's just how it is. Um, These solo meals, what you want to do is small groups, so have like a third person – and make it like, hey, we're, we're already friends. We'd love for you to come if you don't already have plans. That would be cool. Then that way it's like a friend context again. Like they're not going to feel put upon. They're not going to feel like they have to perform for you if both people who are coming besides you are cool. It just makes it a little more comfortable. So that's why it's always good to have like a buddy at the event. They don't necessarily have to come with you, but there's a person you're going to like kick along with and usually be chatting with by default instead of standing there by yourself. That works a lot better. Um, Let's see. Um, Also, one thing I will say, being on the receiving end of a lot of people trying to buy me meals or drinks and and pull my ear, which is appreciated. I I totally don't want to make it seem like, don't do that, I hate it. Being an introvert, like, that's like on the clock for me. So it does put me in like a work mode that makes it so I'm not relaxing. But it makes it a little more comfortable if you do the trio thing, like I said. But also what works is if you do want to like buy me a drink or a meal or something, like I, – and I've talked to other people and, and this is sort of like universally appreciated. If, we're, if you're like, hey, let's go eat, but you're going to talk to me about your business the whole time, just like set that up. So I don't say yes and think we're just going to pal around and then, like, I have to talk business the whole time we're eating. Like, set my expectation. That doesn't mean I won't go. That means if I do go, I know what's up and I can prepare for it so I'm not, like, ordering food thinking I'm going to have, like, a quiet meal and we're just going to chit-chat about family or whatever because I do make that presumption sometimes. Um, So just make it explicit, especially if you're doing, like, a dinner thing. One thing that's cool to do, um, my friend Brad Goss has done this before, where he has like paid memberships and significant numbers of people in his paid memberships are like attendees at some of these events. So he'll have like a client dinner where he just takes his clients who happen to attend that event out to dinner with him. In a context like that, it's a good way to reinforce relationships with your client base, but it also sets the context of the dinner. Because you can say, just a cool, fun thing to get people together, or it's going to be networking. We're going to have a little cocktail hour before for everybody to introduce and get together. When you do it that way, you can set the context and kind of dictate what you want to happen and create the space for that to happen. If that's what you want to do, though, keep that in mind, because I've been invited to dinners at, like, a Brazilian steakhouse with, like, 50 attendees that's supposed to be networking when they sit you all at one long table. So, like... You're networking with two people because that's who you're sitting next to. Everyone else is way too far away. So keep that in mind. If you're creating an experience where you want a certain thing to happen and you're planning a dinner or whatever, you know, round tables. Ask about them. Keep it in mind. Um, Let's see. I think we have one more, which is good because we're right up against the end of the show. Misadventures. So we talked about the partying in the rooms and we talked about, like, I don't say prude in a bad way, 
If you want to be approved, that's cool. I get it. Clean living is for you. That's what. Right, awesome. Do that. But if you're willing to get into misadventures, there are some miscreants that go to these things. And if that, like, if you can hang, like I said, getting involved with people in these situations creates lifelong friends and allies. So don't be afraid to spend time with people that you want to develop a really close relationship, especially if they're going to get up to shenanigans, like if they're going to go out to uh, outside clubs or go, if it's Vegas, if they're going to go on like a gambling run or anything, anything that's like leaving with a bunch of cool people to go to a separate location, yes, it's cool to hang out at the hotel sometimes because there will be a lot of networking going on in the lobby, but outside shenanigans sometimes are superior because there will be things that will happen that would not happen in front of people who are potential customers. People cut loose. It gets bananas. Sometimes people take their shoes off in the nightclub and throw them across the dance floor. That's the kind of stuff that goes down. I don't do that, but I've been there when it happened. So don't be afraid of misadventures. If I can paint a little picture for you, like I said, I already told you about the whiskey shower, the stabbing in the heart with the lawn chair, swimming in the fountain. This did not happen in a room. This didn't happen in a nightclub. This happened on the open patio outside the front of the hotel where they let you smoke. And we uh, paid security to be cool and not complain about us. And we had three cases of beer and four bottles of whiskey just sitting out there on the patio partying with some stewardesses, sorry, flight attendants from Virgin. They were there on a layover from Manchester. So lots of crazy accents. We let them play their music. We drank, smoked, made merry. It was a good time until they came around at 7.30 to hose off the sidewalks and get us out of there. Shenanigans. Excellent, fun time. If I had gone to bed early like I was supposed to, it wouldn't have happened. So keep in mind that misadventures, very, very valuable to get involved in. Again, builds tight relationships that you can capitalize on later on. So scope people out. If cool people are going out to party, get involved. Go out and party. Be cool. It's been massively valuable for me. Um, let's see. I think that's it. I think we're right up against the end of the show. I'm going to let Zane pull up any questions or comments that we haven't covered already. So if you have some, please ask, because I would like for this end part of the show to be a little more engaging. Maybe I, I shouldn't... Uh, wait until the day of the show to announce it if that's what I want but I promise to do better if you do better and we'll work together on that so uh, I'm gonna go through the little spiel and then we're gonna grab any uh, comments that Zane may have noticed once again thanks for joining us live episodes of the cult of copy show are recorded Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern right here on our YouTube channel youtube.com slash cult of copy if you like what you see subscribe we have 21 previous episodes here for you to enjoy share it with your friends leave comments we love that kind of thing. Like I said, if you can join us next week or any future week, we can interact in real time, and it's magical. Um, but if not, if you're watching this episode at a later date, you can indeed leave a comment then too. Uh, Zane does like when I remember to let you know that if you liked a particular part of any episode while you're watching it, leave a comment and put the timestamp in it, and he'll make a little clip of just that part that you like, and then that way you have a video of just that one little bit if you want to reference it which I like to do. I did it for my uh, ice bucket challenge. That worked out very cool, so you can do that uh, if you like. Um, Cult of Copy, if you like what we talk about in this show, we are a discussion group with 10,000 members from all over the world, very, very active community on Facebook. You can join us at the URL below my name. Cultofcopy.com is a shortcut URL currently that points right to the group. I, group, I approve new members uh, to the group uh, a couple of times a week usually in groups of 50 or more. So if you ask to join the group and you haven't been let in yet, I'll get to it. Don't worry about it unless your Facebook profile looks super spammy. Um, so let's see, that's the group. Talked about the show. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin DiTerio, administrator and host of the Cult of Copy show. And then uh, also shout out to Zane Miller, our director, who helps produce this show the way it is. So if you have any meta questions about how to do this Google Hangout live to YouTube sort of thing, he would be the guy. He's got a group on Google Plus called Gtron Marketing 
where they talk about all things Google Hangouts and YouTube and all of that good stuff. So thanks again, Zane, for joining us. Do we have any uh, comments or questions or anything that we missed? Uh, you know what? Actually, uh, quite, a, quite a few comments. Uh, so thank you to the live people here, right? So, awesome. Uh, uh, we got quite a few of them, but uh, let me see. Um, right, so the Love the Mr. T starter is set. <laughs> okay, right. Um, apparently, Vlara was saying that we didn't get a wave from Zane. I had oh, no. Like a regular thing that I did, but, you know, hello. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. Uh, we talked about the, the peacocking, right? Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Then you unblinged. I did so unbling. Talked about, <laughs> talked about meals. Um, Laura Lang <laughs> still says that... Uh, Says that I actually am terrible. I'm like Bert. I'm terrible um, at doing like, imitations. I want to make yeah. it clear. Ernesto Brian Rose, as his <laughs> real name is. Uh, <laughs> actually, it's it's that's not what it is. But I told a whole craps table in Vegas that his name was Ernesto, and every time he would roll, the whole table would chant Ernesto, Ernesto. So again, shenanigans with miscreants. You want to get involved in those misadventures. But I digress. Yeah. He doesn't really sound like Bert. He talks, no. if if possible, he's even louder and talks even faster than me. And uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's why we're friends. Again, to give you an example of misadventures, I hope he doesn't mind me telling the story. The way that I first met E. Brian Rose was years ago at the first Warrior Forum event in Raleigh. And we went to one of these big dinners that a bunch of people went to. And it was at Kanki Japanese Steakhouse. And we're at this huge table. And he's being loud and blustery. I think he'd had a couple of drinks before we even got there. I don't even know what he was talking about, but he's yelling across the table about how he can eat an onion, a raw onion like an apple, and he doesn't even care. So I'm like, we'll do it then. And he thought, like, I was, like, I threw down the gauntlet when really I was just making a joke. But like I said, he'd had a couple. We tell this story two different ways. The way he says it, I practically kick my chair over and point at it like, Jacques Hughes! <laughs> anyway, it became a joke, and I kept ribbing him about it. And uh, Tim Deeney, at that event, later when EBR spoke, got the kitchen to give him a raw onion, and he challenged EBR to eat it on stage. And he didn't eat it on stage, but full credit, out in the hall, he took like five bites out of that onion like it was nothing. Holy and God. then... The ultimate punishment was that he got in the Suburban to go to lunch with us, reeking of this raw onion he just ate. So we're in the South Carolina sun in the middle of August in a big, hot wow. Suburban, and EBR is just running his mouth, talking. <laughs> this onion, he did it on purpose, I know it. But anyway, that's why we're friends, because of shenanigans and being miscreants that have nothing to do with what actually happened at the event itself. So that's why you want to do that kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. fun. But he doesn't sound like Bert. That's just because I'm bad at doing imitations. And probably 90% yeah. of the people I imitate are, they're in this voice. That's what they sound like. That's my imitation voice. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say that that was, sounds like your generic Colin <laughs> yeah. person voice, right? Um, Any, anytime you see me on Facebook where I'm quoting someone but misquoting them, like I'm, I'm paraphrasing them and making it sound terrible, you should listen to it in your head in that voice because that's the, fo the voice in my head that I hear when I'm making fun of people. That's awesome. So, uh, <laughs> Laura has a, has a follow-up question that's a little bit more uh, to the point because this, this was actually something you had brought up earlier about not being creepy at an event. Okay, right? so, so, so this is yeah, one. So th this is one. She says more on how to segue from being creepy to being a friend. Now, I wish I knew specifically something you can do because, I mean, look at me. I look kind of creepy, especially with the mohawk. People told me the mohawk changed the whole demeanor of my look, that I look mean now with a mohawk instead of goofy. I don't know if that's true or not. I think it still looks pretty goofy. But the, the transition part is basically you just, like, you act like you're doing your own thing and you invite people to come along. It's just like, 
like dating, the best dating advice I have from when I was single between wives. Like I see all this pickup artist stuff and I'm like, it's super simple. If you went through a bad breakup and like you don't have anything to do with yourself, make a schedule and start doing all the fun things you want to do. And then whenever you want to have a date, just invite people to come with you. So that way it's not like special date with all the focus on that thing. And this applies in the same way. It's not really like a date, but you're like, I'm doing this cool thing that I actually want to do, and I'm going to get something out of it whether you come or not, but it'd be super cool if you want to come. You're more than welcome to. You too. You coming? You got plans for dinner? Let's go. We're doing this. And like having it taken care of makes it easy for people to agree to come. So like I know people that go golfing at these events. I don't play golf, so I don't go. People like when it's in Orlando, they'll do like a day trip to Disney. This time we took a bunch of people and we went to eat at Splitsville and Disney downtown, which is some kind of like grown up Disney place with booze that you can get into. I don't know. I don't frequent the place, but it was cool. It's an indoor bowling alley and they had beer and burgers. So it was awesome. But the trick with just not, not being weird about it is to just be doing cool stuff that you want people to come along and do. And again, it's hard not to be involved in that or have people want to go if you get yourself into the position where you're going to be speaking on stage and stuff, you know? So like if you're, if you're already, if you've already been on stage and you're published in the materials, it's people that are going to be asking you to participate in things. And that's cool. That's a better position to be in for me as an introvert. I like that better. I never plan these dinners, but I go to them and the people who do really well at it are the ones who are like, got reservations at the steakhouse at eight. What are you doing? I'm like, coming with you to the steakhouse. That's what I'm doing. So hopefully that's helpful. It's hard to say. I'm, I've always been kind of a charming asshole. So I do have that as an unfair advantage when it comes to making friends with total strangers. That's what I got. Any more, Zane? Um, yeah, well, uh, trying to think. There we go. Unpin that thing. Right. Um, so, let's see. Now there was, uh, well, okay. Sean says to avoid sweaty palms. <laughs> right, there's, there's that. Oh, and uh, Jeremiah says, uh, looking gangster. <laughs> so, uh, I, actually, I think I might talk about that on a future episode. What he's talking, Jeremy's, Jeremiah there is uh, talking about a very specific uh, instance that happened the Monday when I got back from uh, uh, JV Zoo. Uh, marketing mayhem with a uh, trusted and respected old school copywriter. But there's more to the story being generated, so I want to get that out of the way, hopefully, before I talk about it. But it will be really funny. If you remember the cult of copy, you might have seen my post about it, but it was pretty hilarious. But we'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about that uh, hopefully next week. Uh, we'll see. But uh, okay. is, is that everything? That was the last comment. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us this Thursday. Hopefully it was not too long for you before I got, you know, into talking about the meat of it. And, you know, hopefully I didn't slur too much from drinking, doing my show all unprofessional, and getting more to the point, you know, whatever. Whatever. But uh, it's been fun as always. Join us next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. We'd love to have you. Until then, have a great weekend, and adios from the Cult of Copy.